Okay, it looks like we're ready to go with part three of chapter one. Let's dive back into explanatory and response variables. Very frequently, you'll have a study with exactly two variables, or if it has more variables, a certain analysis is only two variables. And in that case, it becomes important to determine which variable is which, because those two variables usually, at least in the mind of the researchers, um, are playing different roles in a study. A one variable, specifically, is sometimes suspected or hypothesized or theorized to influence the other one. So there's a clear causal chain, there's a chain in time. Variable one comes first and then variable two changes. When variable one does something, then variable two responds. And the, the first one, the one that's suspected to do the influencing, can be called the explanatory variable, and the second one can be called the response variable. Whatever our suspicions are as researcher, as researchers, and frequently we have very causal suspicions. This is because mm -hmm. it's a causal universe and we want to try and explain what's causing what, right? We don't just want to see what's associated with what, we want to see what actually makes something happen. So we lean towards causal explanations. However, you can only really make a causal explanation or a causal interpretation of your research results if you did the right research design to, to do that. So your ability to make causal determinations is totally based on the kind of research design that you used and how well you used it. So when you're reading uh, research or when you're writing up your own research or doing analyses for this class or something like that, you cannot use causal language, at least validly. I mean, you can do whatever you want. You can be as crazy or stupid as you want to be. I, I've applied that in my own life many times. But you want to be right, right? I mean, we came to college because we like to be right. Well, if you want to be right, if you want to be valid, if you want to be saying things that aren't insane, then you can't actually use causal language unless you did a good controlled experiment. An experiment is not just a generic term. I mean, in general terms, you can say any kind of sitting around and observing the world is an experiment. But in research design terms, an experiment has a one very specific characteristic that no other kind of research de design does. Uh, we'll get into that in a minute. If you did a good experiment, then you can use causal language to interpret your results. Language that implies that one of your variables actually caused or led to or affected a change in your other variable. So here's some examples. So variable A leads to variable 2. So smoking leads to cancer. Uh, income inequality affects social unrest. Um, investment in nuclear power drives economic development, you know, et cetera, influences, determines. These are all variables that are usually implying causation. So you have to be very careful not to use this kind of language. This is far from an exhaustive list. But uh, you have to be very careful not to use this language unless it's warranted, unless you did the right kind of research study. And when you read other people's research and they start using this research, this kind of language, you need to say, wait a minute, did they do the right kind of research design to determine that there was some causality happening there? Are they appropriately respecting the kind of research experiment that they did? Or are they trying to stretch what they did into something it really isn't? So here's an application question uh, that we can use to discuss some of these issues of experimenting. This is an experiment. Um, you want to affect types of light on exam performance. 180 students uh, show up. Now these are selected by some process. We don't know how they were selected. We don't know how they were sampled, right? We don't know what the population is, so let's leave that out of this. But they are randomly assigned, which is different. After they've been selected, then you divide them into groups sometimes. And when you divide them into groups, one of the best ways to do that is randomly, and that's called random assignment. So they have three classrooms. One classroom is dimly lit, another has yellow lighting, and a third has white lighting. And then they're all given the same exam, and of course you want to compare and see who does better on that exam, right? Classroom one, classroom two, classroom three. So which of the following is, is correct? I'll pause here for a second and let you read this. Um, you might want to pause your video so you can think about it, and then I'll give you the right answer. All right, I'm going to move on. Here's the right answer. Now, first of all, you need to get these in the right order. The researchers believed that type of light would affect exam performance. That's the direction of causality. Now, if they had switched it around and said exam performance would be affected by, that's just a different wording. It's still exam performance being affected. It's still light affecting performance. So explanatory has to be something about the light, and response has to be something about performance. 
but in this case you have to also try and get the terminology right. So this is this becomes kind of an issue that people don't really teach you about, but you need to find one noun phrase or a noun that describes your variable that includes all the possibilities of your variable. Sometimes you punt and, and you don't and you just could describe all the levels, but it's better. It's, it's not as good to say dimly lit yellow and white fluorescent is my variable because that's technically not true. It's better to say type of light. Do you see how type of light is a single noun or noun phrase? It's a noun phrase that uh, describes variations in light and it includes as a possibility things like dim lighting, yellow lighting, and white fluorescent lighting. So that's the name of a variable rather than the levels or possible values of the variable. That variable, by the way, is a categorical variable with three levels. It's unordered, regular, categorical. So experiments are specialized research designs. Experiments are some of the research designs you read about in your science textbooks with Galileo and whatnot and Newton. Because these things can tell us in greater detail and more specifically about causality. The key to an experiment is that there is a manipulated explanatory variable. If you manipulate an explanatory variable, then it gets a special name. Now it's the independent variable. Technically, you're not supposed to use independent and dependent except with experiments, but a lot of people mess with that rule. But technically, it becomes an independent variable only when you manipulate it. And then you measure the response variable. So that's experimentation in a nutshell. Go mess with something and then jump back and watch and see what happens. The thing you messed with is the independent variable. And the thing you watch to see what happens is the dependent variable. So in an, in an experiment, they have special names. Explanatory and response are independent and dependent variables. Now, manipulation means that the researcher determined the conditions under which something would happen. The researcher determined the experience that the participants, whether they're human or not, would have. So, <coughs> excuse me, it, in the light experience, the researcher has to decide who goes into which classroom. If you just say, pick a classroom, now it's not an experiment anymore. If you just let people pick their own classrooms, now it is an observational study. An observational study is where things happen as they were going to happen normally and nobody manipulates, nobody interferes, nobody decides what a person's experience or what an individual's experience in that study is going to be. And you still measure the outcome variable, but you measure the explanatory variable too. So if you let people decide which room to go into with the three types of light, then first you're just measuring which room they went into, and second you're measuring how well they did on the exam. But you see how that screws up your ability to have causal interpretations. So in the second situation where you just let people decide which room to go into, um, afterwards you might want to say, wow, the people in group three had higher scores on the exam. So fluorescent lights actually make people get higher scores. Can you think of how that's not necessarily the case, there's, there's another possibility now, right? The possibility is that whatever it was that caused people to want to go into fluorescent rooms, that was responsible both for them going into the fluorescent rooms and also their high score on the exam. Or maybe even a preference for, for, for fluorescent rooms. Whoever likes fluorescent lights the most, they're the, they're the ones who do the best in the exams. There are possibilities you cannot rule out now. Whereas if you had just manipulated and, set and said, you will go here and you will go here, especially if you've done it randomly, randomly assigned to people, then you can't, then somebody can't criticize you afterwards and say, well, what if people who just like fluorescent lights, you can say, no, no, they didn't get to choose. People who liked the lights didn't go in there. I told them to go in there. So sure, some people who liked lights were in there, but some people who hated fluorescent lights were probably in there. And so fluorescent light lovers were probably in the other two rooms too. So your criticism is invalid. I have a windmill in my beard. Um, in, in both cases, we call the variables X and Y. X is whichever one we suspect is doing some causing, and Y is whichever one we suspect is getting affected by X. And a lot of textbooks still take in observational um, studies, they still call the explanatory and response variables the independent and dependent variable, but that's not technically correct. Explanatory and response is a little better. Now, let's look at this example here. Let's look at this, this uh, write-up of a study. All right, I'm going to move on. So if you're not done reading, you might want to pause. So what kind of a study is it? Think about this. Is it experimental or is it observational? Here's the answer. It's observational. Let's go back and look. Did somebody make some girls eat breakfast and 
make others not? Or did some girls say it? Or did some people, did somebody go in and randomly assign some people to eat cereal and other people not to eat cereal? No. The girls got to choose themselves. This is a classic example of an observational study. And so therefore, can you conclude causality? Can you say eating cereal led to being thin? And if you want to know a little bit more about what you should be suspicious of, you can always ask who sponsored the study, who paid for it. So when you look at results like this, you see that girls who ate cereal for breakfast were thinner than girls who didn't, right? That was one of the outcomes. And so naturally, the researchers kind of spun it like this. They kind of let you think. They weren't hardcore on the causal language, but they kind of let you think that cereal makes you thin. I'm living proof that this is not the case, by the way, so I'm suspicious of this study. But that's an anecdote, so there you go. Whenever you see this happening, reverse the variables. Whenever you see somebody making a causal interpretation of something that did not have strong experimental methodology, that was an observational study, reverse the variables and see if it still works. So, I'm being thin, I'm being sloppy with my variables, because thin is only one end of the spectrum, so body weight or body mass index. So could it be that body mass index causes a preference for certain types of breakfasts? I think so. We know the way leptin works and signals the brain for hunger signals. We know the way that fat um, messes with your brain's perception of necessity for eating and need for calories and stuff like this. So if you're a heavier person, maybe you crave some sausage and some bacon in the morning and some eggs and maybe a lot of syrup on that pancake, right? Because your body might make you crave that stuff, whereas having a little bowl of special K with not even any sugar on it, just a couple of berries. And this is probably Elmer's glue. I know it's supposed to be milk, but I read somewhere they use Elmer's glue for advertising photos. Mm. Not good. So could being thin cause cereal eating? See, I think there's a way you could make that work. And so that weakens this interpretation. Now, if they'd done a true experiment, this would not be nearly as much of an option. Always take the third step. So step number one is reverse the variables and see if you can make that make sense. And step number th step number two, well, step number one is do whatever they do. Step number two, reverse things. And then possibility number three is, could there be some factor or group of factors that could lead to both of these things? And this is actually incredibly common just because the world is complex. So what if people who ate cereal for breakfast actually were more likely to have like health conscious parents and that's why they ate cereal. Therefore, they were getting all sorts of health messages. Or what if people who ate cereal for breakfast had parents who were sort of genetically more thin than people who didn't eat cereal for breakfast? And so therefore, this genetic thinness was leading to the cereal eating habit and or the parents' preference for certain kinds of breakfast. There's a lot of possibilities here. There are usually many, many possibilities you can think of, and this is one of the things we do when we're done with research. We try and think up alternate interpretations. What are all the possibilities for the results we got? We're always looking at the results and saying, what made you happen? Where did you come from? Why, did, why do you exist? Things you don't really want to ask children because it would disturb them, but you ask research results this all the time. So trying to figure out what's actually going on in the world, we look at sampling methods quite a lot. Well, we're trying to select, I mean, you know what, a sample is just some of the population, right? But which some, which subset of observations is a huge deal. So the easiest kind of sample to conceptualize, but very difficult to do sometimes, is a simple random sample. A simple random sample is you just have one group of participants in your study and they came from the population. You just like if you're doing a simple random sample of everybody in Chicago, you would just get, I don't know, a census list of every single person in the whole freaking city. And then you would randomly select as many of them as you could afford or decided was good. Maybe you only going to get like a hundred of them or something. And you randomly, truly randomly, like you tell a computer to randomly select or you use a table, a random number table and go through the phone book and code people's numbers and select people randomly. And then you call those people. That can be messy because what if people don't want to participate? And more importantly, what if you can't actually get the full list? What if uh, some people on the list don't want to come, etc.? And sometimes it doesn't really represent everything who's supposed, everybody who's supposed to be represented. There's a possibility that you would miss some important kinds of variability just because random means anything can happen. So sometimes we do a stratified sample. A stratified sample is where on one or more variables that you know to be important, 
you group your sample in ways that you imagine or you know that the population is grouped. So let's say um, you find a city somewhere and you're trying to find out people's approval rating of the mayor and you think race and ethnicity is an important issue. But there are only three races, ethnicities in the entire city. Some people identify themselves as Caucasian white. Some people identify themselves as African-American black. And some people identify themselves as Hispanic. They're 85 percent white people, 15 percent black people, 5 percent Hispanic people. And you're going to do a sample of 100 people out of this city of, say, 50,000. Well, in your sample of 100 people, you would divide your sample and your first group would be 85 people. Since there's 85% white people in the city, then your then 85% of your sample or 85 people better be white people. Now those people should be randomly selected from all possible white people in the city. So it's random within that stratum, within that layer. And then the next group would be 15 people in your sample. 15% of your sample should be black because there are 15% black people in the city. So you those 15 people are randomly selected from the 15% of the 50,000 people in the town who are black. And then the last five people in your sample should be Hispanic because there are 5% uh, Hispanic people in the population and there are 5% Hispanic people in your sample. So stratified sampling can get really complex if you have multiple variables to stratify on, but it can yield some extremely good results, some extremely accurate results. And a lot of major polling companies use this kind of sampling strategy regularly. So cluster sampling is a, a little bit of a different one. Sometimes we use this in like educational research. You see this in political research where the units of measurement aren't necessarily people sometimes or sometimes if it's people. But a classic example is like, say, you're studying schools uh, around the country. And there are thousands of school districts around the country, right? There are a lot of school districts and a lot of schools. And so let's say you're going to you decide that you're going to interview all the teachers in um, 10 school districts. So you just randomly select the school district. So the population could be clustered by school districts. And then you randomly sample a few school districts. And then you try and sample and you try and um, observe, get observations from every individual within the cluster. So you have 10 school districts and then you try and interview every single teacher in each of those school districts. So you're not randomly selecting from within the clusters. In this case, you're randomly selecting the clusters. But you can also randomly select clusters and then randomly select from within the clusters. All infinite variations are possible. So now that we've just busted that out, let's talk about experiments again. The main thing about experiments that makes them uh, amenable to causal interpretation, besides manipulating an independent variable, that's the most important one. Once you've manipulated the variable, you also have to control extraneous sources of influence. So what we mean by that is anything that would screw up your ability to make a causal interpretation at the end. So let's imagine the light study, dim light, yellow light, white light, right? People went into three different classrooms. What if the dim light, yellow light, and white light conditions were randomly assigned, but happened on different days? And then maybe it was Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and the white light people went in on Saturday. Well, then Think of what a person could say after you were done with your study and you said, we, we just demonstrated that fluorescent lights make people do better on exams because my fluorescent light group had higher scores than the dim or the yellow light groups. Well, you can think of a really good rejoinder to that, right? You can say, well, maybe the fluorescent light group, because they came in on Saturday, there was something about being in there on Saturday that made them have higher scores. Maybe it wasn't the light. Maybe it was that they were relaxed and had more time on their hands or felt cheerful because it was Saturday morning. Who knows? Um... So you need to control. So you should do them at the same time, right? Or at least on the same day of the week or something, probably at the same time, send them to different classrooms. But once they're in physically different classrooms, then, then you have some other problems. What if some of the classrooms are not exactly the same as the others? Maybe some classrooms are bigger and some are smaller. The smaller ones, they have to sit closer together in the room to take their exam. The, more, the bigger ones, they can sit farther apart. What if there's a noise in one or more of the classrooms that's not in one of the other ones? Even the color of the walls might make a difference. How far you have to walk to get to that classroom? You don't know what's going to make a difference. A lot of it probably won't make a difference, but that's why in serious experimental research, people kind of go crazy trying to regularize the experience for all the people in the different groups. Now, one source of variability between the groups that's a big problem sometimes is individual variability, the variability of individuals. So if you let people pick their own rooms, that's a big problem. Some, some bunch of characteristics that people who like fluorescent lights might have in common 
might influence your outcome versus dim lights versus yellow lights. So randomization, random assignment, not sampling, but assignment is one of the ways that we minimize that. So we send, once you get your whole group of 180 people, then you randomly decide which, which, uh, is it six? Yeah, which 60 of them go to this group and which 60 go to this group and which 60 go to this group. And so that should take care of the individual variation. It's not guaranteed to, but with 60 in each group, that's a pretty good number. You can, you wouldn't expect much variation between groups, but you test for it when you're done, just to check. But the most important thing here, I think, is, is replication. Replication is just when you do the study again, or someone else does the study again using your methods and see if you get the same results. Psychology has a big problem with that, and if you want to read online about this, you'll find out that we're, at least there are some people within psychological research trying to address this issue that we don't replicate our studies, and sometimes when we do replicate our studies, we get different results. That's bad. Well, it's not bad. It's just bad that we didn't replicate them in the first place, because now we have a screwed up idea of what the world is and what people's thoughts and behavior are actually about. I'm not going to go into blocking because we're not going to learn about it. It's not going to be on any tests. Um, you can read about it in the book if you like. There's a decent description of it there. And I think I'm going to be all done now. And we'll move on to the next uh, little video here in a few minutes.